Hello, everybody. I'm Christy Amaker. I'm with Gateway Academy, and I'm moderating today's webinar. Um, I wanted to thank the Microfinance Gateway team for hosting us. And thanks to all of you for joining us today as we share early lessons from Gateway Academy on what to consider when launching an e-learning program. So before we get started, we have just a few logistical items that we wanted to go over with you. Um, just letting you know that this is an audio broadcast, so your microphones will be muted during the entire webinar session. If you want to ask us a question, and please do, we welcome those, use the chat box on the right-hand side of the session. And you can submit those um, throughout the whole presentation. I'll be collecting them, and we'll make sure to have lots of time for Q&A at the end. To make sure that your question is seen by me, please select all participants from the drop-down menu when you're sending your question. And I also wanted to let you know that the recording of this will be emailed to everybody when we're done. The other thing I did want to tell you is that we're going to um, be asking you just a few questions using our poll feature. So please do take a moment and answer those for us. So during today's webinar, you're going to hear from Gateway Academy's Josephine Kibe, and then also from Kausi Nasemu from AB Bank Zambia, from Kweku Aqua from Fidelity Bank Ghana. Thank you very much to both of you for being here with us today. So um, first, Josephine is going to give us a quick overview of what Gateway Academy is to provide some context for today's session. After that, Kelsey will share AB Bank's experience in starting an e-learning program. And then Kweku will share about Fidelity Bank's um, Academy's journey. Then we'll hand it back over to Josephine to share some early lessons that Gateway Academy's learned on launching e-learning throughout the different financial institutions that we're working with. And then finally, we'll finish with some Q&A. So um, we're handing it over to Josephine now, and you will see just a few quick questions on the right-hand side. If you can take a moment and answer those, but we'll move ahead with the presentation while you're doing that. Go ahead, Josephine. So thank you, Christy, for this. Um, I can. I would like to remind all the participants that for those who, who have questions to ask, please feel free to put your questions on the chat function, and we will be able to answer at the end of this presentation. I can see from the poll results that most of us know what CGAP is, but for the benefit of those who don't know what we do, I'll provide a few details of what CGAP, what we do at CGAP. So CGAP is a partnership of 34 international development organizations, and we are housed at the World Bank. And our vision at CGAP is to we seek to provide for a world where everyone has access to and can use financial services to better their lives. Therefore, our mission is to improve the lives of the poor by encouraging innovations that advance knowledge, are responsible, and provide sustainable, inclusive financial markets. So what is Gateway Academy? Gateway Academy is an innovative, project that has been developed and implemented by CGAP in partnership with MasterCard Foundation. Currently, we work in seven African countries. We are in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Malawi, Zambia, and Ghana. 
And these are the focus countries that we are beginning with in our project. But we foresee ourselves moving into other countries, and we've had interest from countries such as Botswana, Namibia, Nigeria, and our vision is to move into Francophone Africa. So in order for us to understand exactly what Gateway Academy is, I'll provide a background onto the research that has gone through before beginning of this project. So we appreciate the fact that a capacity gap exists in financial inclusion amongst financial service providers, policymakers, and other stakeholders. And this gap mainly relates to the entry and middle-level staff members in this financial service provide providers' institutions. Also, through our research, we have noticed that the capacity building market is not working sufficiently to meet the needs of these financial service providers, is broken, and therefore it becomes cumbersome for financial service provi providers when they are looking for training for their staff members. Of course, we understand that for a financial service provider, the aim of having um, a good training is to increase the effectiveness of capacity building by optimizing the training budget that they have. And for a training service provider, the aim is to, their aim is to increase access to the market so that they can be able to increase their revenue and be able to develop content that will be, that will be needed by the financial service providers, that will be useful for the financial service providers. But as it stands now, the market is broken. For a training service provider looking to expand their market, they have to go and search for financial service providers who would be consumers of their content. And on the other hand, for financial service provider need, needing content, they have to go into the market to search for those training service providers that can provide content that is uh, relevant for financial inclusion for their institution. And therefore, for us at Gateway Academy, we are basing our work on the following elements. We are, pro we are providing an online learning platform where training service providers will be able to upload content easily and financial service providers will be able to access that content easily. We are providing an avenue where there is market facilitation whereby demand and supply can meet. So the demand for content from the, from the financial service providers can meet with the supply of content from the training service providers. Also, we are looking at providing curated content, content that is organized, content that is relevant for financial inclusion. We are also providing training service provider capacity building, and this is for those training service providers that see the value and benefit of having their content online. We are providing capacity to make sure that that is possible. And again, for the financial service providers capacity building, we are providing content that is relevant, that is um, necessary for those institutions that uh, deal with financially inclusive markets. So our aim is to bring together training service providers and financial service providers so that a financial service provider that is uh, looking into acquiring content has many options and can approach different training service providers and also a training service provider that is looking into expanding its market has access to uh, many financial service providers that can access this content. And therefore, we see ourselves as market facilitators where Gateway Academy is the link between financial service providers looking for content and training service providers who are willing and able to provide content that is uh, necessary for financial inclusion. And that is our logo. And so the work that we have done so far in uh, from 2016 till now, we've divided our work into phases. We began with the alpha phase, whereby we approached different training sub service providers to provide bite-sized content that we could test uh, in, for financial service providers in our focus countries. So part of the reason why we had Alpha was to involve the stakeholders right from the beginning so that they own the platform, they own the content, and, and therefore they'll see the need and the value for them to engage with us. For those courses that were successful, they moved into the demo 
uh, space where by now we had full courses delivered on our new platform. We went out to our partner institutions and they tested these courses and those courses that were successful moved on to the beta, beta phase where we are now, where we have full courses that are delivered on our fully functional platform. So for us, right from the beginning, this has been a collaborative and a co-creation initiative. So we have involved our stakeholders right from the beginning. The picture that you see on the screen is our first workshop in Nairobi in June 2016 whereby we brought together financial service providers, training service providers, and other stakeholders from our focus country to start thinking about how we can shape the direction and the vision for our academy. So I would like to invite Tausi from AB Bank to share with us the efforts and the initiatives that AB Bank has taken in this, uh, in this field. So welcome, Tausi. Thank you very much, Josephine. I'll run you through the e-learning journey at AB Bank uh, Zambia. So AB Bank is part of a holding group that is present in 10 different countries, six of which are in Africa. So AB Bank Zambia was established in 2011 and currently has seven branches, six of which are in the capital and one is in another city. Every bank has 450 staff, around 400 staff. And what this means is our recruitment strategy has been to recruit fresh graduates from university. And usually these do not have prior work experience. This is why we decided to think of better solutions with regards to training. So e-learning became very important for us, looking at how much we had to invest in uh, in training our staff and also building capacities within the institution. So we thought this is a solution because of the many benefits attached to it. That are time efficiency. Most of the time we deliver face-to-face -face training and we invite our staff from different branches and they have to take an hour or two to travel to the head office to receive such training. So if it is a one or two days training, it means they will be away from from their workstations and they'll be attending training. So we thought by delivering most training online, our staff would have enough time also to execute their duties other than uh, spend most of their time in class. So this is also effective in terms of cost because now we would have to spend less on transportation, we spend less on accommodation, we have to spend less also on stationery that we print out uh, that we give participants in face-to-face -face tr uh, training. Another benefit for our learners is they can choose what to learn and when to learn. So with e-learning, there's more content that can be provided and participants are able to, to choose what type of courses they would like to take and they can take these, these courses whenever they are free. They can take the courses at their homes or during weekends so the e-learning the e content is available. They can access it at, uh, using different gadgets. We also thought this is the best approach, being a part of uh, a holding group. Most of our processes are standardized. So with e-learning, it would be much easier to exchange knowledge, transfer of knowledge from one bank to another, as well as uh, delivering training. It would be more cost effective if the if the content is provided online. Then looking at our average age group in our institution, most of the staff are just coming from university, they're very young and they're very eager to new innovation. So e-learning is something that is exciting to them and we think this is the best approach for such a target, for such a target group. And most of them like currently in the branches, they have WhatsApp groups that, are, that they're constantly using every now and then. So if they can access learning also from their mobile devices, this would make it more effective. So what we have done so far, we started this, uh, we started the discussions of e-learning in 2015 with uh, CGAP. 
and we have been with them in the different stages of development of the Gateway Academy. Um, we have uh, so far taken three different um, courses uh, with them, and initially uh, our main priority area was digital financial services, which is a training need that we identified as an institution, and also we had um, uh, Helix Institute, which was paired uh, with us because they were providing us with this content. So they also came on ground and they conducted uh, uh, training needs assessment in order to contextualize the training as well as identify the right target group. So with this, they were able to, to provide us with the right content. We had 25 people that, that enrolled for this uh, for this course in April 2017, and we had another training. So for, for the one that we de that was delivered in April 2017, it was uh, delivered in a course of one week. We had another training on digital financial services that was delivered in June. So this one was more comprehensive. It was a five weeks program, and we had 12 participants that uh, took the course. We had another training that was delivered by Strathmore University through the gateway, uh, through the through collaborations with CGAP. So this was for, for 15 branch managers and heads of department. So this was a blended learning course. Um, it was a, a half-day face-to-face uh, training and online training. So our journey has not uh, been smooth. We had, of course, uh, some hiccups uh, since we decided to implement um, e-learning in our institutions. And some of, some of the thoughts were around having inadequate computers in our institution. So right now, the setup is not everybody has um, individual computers that they can, act that they, they can easily access. So some of the staff have shared computers such uh, shared computers, which of course would not be possible for them to take, for example, a five-week course easily. So this was one of the challenge, and with this, we thought as an institution to set up an e-lab, which uh, has been set up in the head office. Other than this, of course, this is not the main solution because either way, they have to come to the head office to access this content, but also we thought of us providing computers in the branches. So this is something that we are still uh, trying to implement, as that now uh, our staff are using their own mobile devices or their own personal laptops to access uh, the content. But we are also thinking in terms of providing some computers that would be designated to e-learning. Another challenge was limited internet access in as much as we have our staff um, uh, with designated computers to them. They do not have internet access due to the nature of business uh, being in a bank, so there are very few people that have access to the internet. So with this, we, we, we sat down with our management team and with our IT team, and we were able to grant access to the learners directly to the, to the e-learning platform. So this uh, somehow was able to mitigate the challenge of uh, limited internet access. And also, we had um, uh, we have inadequate local capacity to support e-learning initiative. So this is something that we are looking, especially for the future. Um, are we able to? Are we going to be able to to manage this on our own? Are we going to be able to also develop our own content or upload it uh, onto the gateway platform? So this is something that we are we are thinking of in terms of building capacities within the bank uh, to have somebody that is uh, going to be developing content, to have somebody that is also going to be following up with the learners. So it's uh, already something that we are already discussing. Then the other, the other challenge that we had is, of course, there were a number of concerns of how staff would now spend more time on their computers doing the courses rather than work. So this is not, um, this of course is something that uh, we cannot easily monitor, 
but also the, the, the performance management system is, is very clear and also most of the staff have uh, qualitative targets so it's easy to, to follow up and it's easy for us to really see if um, staff are spending more time on uh, completing a course and, and not. So we still think even if they're spending more time on completing the courses, it has a positive impact to their performance. Then the other challenge that we had is uh, 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 bandwidth limitations. We, we did anticipate that from the beginning before even rolling out uh, any online courses. So for this, we had deliberately carried out a bandwidth test um, which somehow gave us positive results that we could uh, we could easily have success in the in the program. So, however, when we did the first test, uh, when we tested the first course, um, I think it had high bandwidth uh, uh, requirements. So most of the most of the the delivery mode was was uh, mainly videos. So our staff had uh, connectivity issues. So most of the time the videos were interrupted, some videos were also not able to, to be viewed. So for this one, in this, uh, it was something that we raised as a concern and in the second uh, course that we took, it, it was uh, a light uh, kind of delivery mode. There were no videos. I think it was something that was easy and we did not experience any connectivity issues. The other challenge is how to change the mindset of our staff because they're used to face-to-face -face classroom. So now you are introducing them to e-learning. Does it mean they don't have to travel to Germany, for example, because we have um, a training program where we we send our staff uh, uh, to Germany? And of course, they're excited to travel. So now, how to 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 change the mindset? To now say you can now have this course uh, delivered via the platform instead of having to travel and getting uh, your PDM. So for this one, of course, we try to communicate and sell it in a very positive sense. Uh, it's not completely replacing all face-to-face -face training. It's something that can reduce. So for example, for a program that, um, that would take two years, for example, and you have to travel like four times uh, in two years to Germany, it's something that can be reduced for, to two times and some of the content can be provided on the platform. So this is uh, something that the staff understand and if, it's, if a training, for example, also could take uh, one week or two days classroom training, some of the content can be delivered online such that it's only reduced to half a day. So this, made, uh, this makes positive sense for them because they also have targets that they have to fulfill and then they realize that it's actually of benefit to spend less time in class but of course, we cannot we cannot say we will replace all classroom training because we we do understand the value in uh, in also having face to face uh, training. So I will hand over to Kweku so that he can also share his experience. Okay, thank you, Tausi. Um, so. Um, for us at Fidelity Bank, we have had um, an implemented e-learning over the last um, five years going into six. And for us, um, it was almost the same reasons why Tausi um, has enumerated um, during her presentation. So before I proceed, we'll just walk you through who we are, and then we can pick it up from the reasons why we embarked on this journey as well. So, so, Fidelity Bank is um, an indigenous Ghanaian bank that started off in 1998 as a discount house and has grown into a full-fledged financial institution providing all kinds of range of services with currently spread across the 10 regions of Ghana with 72 branches currently and it started as the fastest growing bank in Ghana. And, uh, at the moment. For us, we believe that we want to build a world-class financial institution that provides superior returns for our shareholders or our stakeholders we, who are identified as our customers, our shareholders, our employees, and our regulators. 
we want to, as part of our mission, is to be among the top three banks in Ghana by December 2018, based on certain key performance indicators, which include deposit, fee quality of loan book, cost to income ratio, and return on return to shareholders or stakeholders anchored on our people, our service and processes, and our technology. So for we believe that um, learning is moving at a very fast pace and there's a need uh, for change in our approach to learning, hence e-learning. And the reason is anchored on, on the time to, comp uh, to competence, which is uh, affected by the speed of change. So by the time you make any changes happen, things have just wrapped up and then you need to keep up to with the technology that is ongoing. Um, advances in technology is also a reason why information overload and then doing more with less resources available. And obviously what many people will term as the generational differences within the organization. So we set out to build a learning culture as, as the foundation of, of, of our journey. So building a learning culture, a continuous learning culture or strategy, which we touted and uh, developed into a, a five-stage approach. So the first stage being supplemental, the second place, uh, stage being targeting um, content to specific roles, and then being strategic at the third stage. And then at the fourth stage and fifth stage is integration and optimization. So um, we, we, we look at learning and e-learning um, from the consumer perspective. And here when we talk about the consumer, we are looking at the employees within the organization and from their perspective underpinned by the generational differences and how different ways with which people learn. So we use the um, description of going into an ice cream parlor and then having a full bouquet of ice cream and determining which one fits your need. So we're saying that 86% of the top organizations globally are proactive in understanding how their employees learn the best. So employees, we, we, we also believe that are overwhelmed and distracted most of the time uh, by different things happening around them and different things that they tend to learn. And we think that 1% of a typical work week is all that an employee has to focus on training and development. And this is em um, emphasized in the Bersin and Associate Human Capital Reports of 2016. So our whole learning strategy is anchored on the 70-20-10 principle, which is the alignment to an impactful way in which people learn. So we say that 70% of what people learn is through application, through uh, um, yeah. So, so we believe that. Um, just a minute, please. All right, so we believe that 70% of um, the way employees learn is through their day-to-day -day activities that they do on the job, or which we term as application. 20% um, is through peer learning or interaction with their relationships in the office, colleagues, line managers, and even outside. And it's only 10% that people learn through the former learning way. So, in a building up on that, we want to tune in to the learner's voice, and we think that they are, the learner is always asking that you should give him or give me the tools and support that I require to change and adapt my current work practices, which is anchored on change, um, solving, um, new, uh, solving new problems or problems that arises um, is also another area of the employee applying what um, they learn to the workplace with these three uh, within the informal way 
and when you talk about a formal way employees learn, we are looking at giving them easy ways to learn in relation to what they already know, and then also giving me or giving them with an in with new knowledge and skills that they require for their job. And in this area, we are looking at HR practitioners or institutions tuning up to the way their employees learn the best. So we've done this by blending our learning programs. And currently on e-learning, we have um, 300 skills of e-learning content, which we buy off the shelf for all our employees. And we've also worked in partnership with the Harvard Business School on with the AMO, using their model of the Harvard Management of Programs for our middle level leadership development program, which we pick it up and then we blended it. Um, currently, we have trained over 100 employees within our middle level managers, and we think that it's been a, a, a useful exercise. So, um, in terms of learning for us, we're looking at it from a different a different perspective and um, unpacking our blended learning experience. Um, and what you see on the screen is an example of the various targeting that we do for our employees. In building an e-learning journey, um, one of the key things that needs to be undertaken is the convincing and the marketing and communication that um, organizations need to embark on. And these are examples of the things that we use in building our case and marketing and building up momentum among our staff to ensure that we get acceptance from their end. This is also an example of a consolidated um, report of how far we've been able to reach our employees uh, within, the past, within the past three years. Um, of our journey um, from zero um, to a high report, which has been a very useful exercise, and we've shared this across a number of organizations within our country, Ghana. So just as Talsi also enumerated the various challenges and opportunities that they had, we have also experienced some challenges as well. Um, one major challenge is the buy-in of of middle level managers who are at the core forefront of engaging um, lower level employees. Um, technical environments um, of the content that we bought was uh, at some point not suitable and conflicting with some of our banking applications, which affected um, the learning experience, which we have managed to resolve. Um, enhancing, um, we, we embarked on building what we call e-learning champions and assigning people to drive e-learning within their various departments. And we think that we thought that it was we could have done better in that area. Um, there is always the push and the pull factor of learning, where at some point we have to be pushing people to learn. But the journey was to get to the point where people will begin to pull content to themselves without um, um, HR or learning and development functions driving that extensively. Bandwidth issues have always been an issue, and it will always be an issue until new ways and new things have been found. Local content development is also an issue, um, which we are looking forward to building our own content and uploading it on our platform. Um, there have been many successes for us, and um, uh, we've been able to do a good campaign in marketing and communication, um, counseling, Courses were selected and aligned to learning parts of our businesses and business strategies. Ownership of learning models by each business unit is what uh, we, we is one strategy that we use, where business units will determine what courses should be should be applied to their department or um, unit and people within their unit. Uh, we also went to set up learning centers, e-learning centers, where people can easily go in and learn without necessarily, um, and to just to cut away the problem and the argument that they won't have time to learn. Um, we also set up learning months with which people can, um, we, we dedicate it to as e-learning months where uh, throughout the month there will be talks and communication on e-learning, 
and sharing ideas of ways with which we could improve our learning experiences. And as well, um, um, we integrated our e-learning structure or program with our ILT, instructor-led training programs or face-to-face -face training programs. So for you to attain any e um, classroom training, it comes with a complementary e-learning program that must be completed before you come into the classroom. And it's a way of blending learning and encouraging people to learn uh, on their own. We also held e-learning clinics or learning clinics where we went through the various offices, departments across the country to engage them and, and, and get their buy-in and also solicit feedback from them on how we could ex improve the experience. And then finally, we, we're currently using the various learning aids and um, summaries of the content that we have on our platform for group discussions within our department where we meet more, each department meets on a day-to-day -day basis or regular basis and then they re-emphasize the learning gains that each person has learned and then how they can apply the um, learning that has been gained on their job. So in summary, um, it's, it's a good experience. It's, a, it's been a good journey, but of obviously with some challenges, but we think that um, it's been a worthwhile and we are looking forward to partnering Gateway Academy um, on their next chapter of activities, which we've already done with some of their courses and has been useful to us. But we're looking forward to um, having those happen in the next few months as we partner with them as well. So um, I'll hand over to Josephine as well. Josephine. So thank you very much, Kweku and Tausi, for doing a very elaborative presentation to show us your journeys and the strategies that your institutions have taken in order to make e-learning a success. So in the next session, I'm going to share with you early lessons that we have learned on launching our e-learning project. So, so far, through the alpha, the demo, and the beta stages, we have had over 250 learners from 16 financial institutions that have gone through the Gateway Academy to test and validate the concepts that, that we started with, the hypothesis that we started with from the beginning of the project. So, so far, we have worked with the institutions that you see on the, on the slide above, and we've been able to reach all of our focus countries except uh, Malawi, but right now we are working with Malawi on our next uh, phase, and therefore we'll be able to reach even beyond our focus countries. These are the training service providers that we are working with currently, and in the next phase we are also reaching to other training providers, so we have Axion, we have our colleagues at CGAP who have developed content. We have Helix Digital Services and Strathmore Business School in Kenya. So for this section, I'm going to look at what are those things that an institution needs to consider when they want to implement an e-learning program. Three important factors that all institutions must take into consideration when wanting to implement an e-learning program are one, learning culture, two, widespread organizational involvement, and three, access to e-learning. When we talk about learning culture, notice we are not saying e-learning culture, but learning culture. So learning corresponds to the effort that an organization takes to make sure that all their staff members develop the skills, the necessary attitudes and behaviors that will make them perform well at their jobs. An effective learning culture also inclu includes training, but not just training, but goes beyond into development of the staff members where managers are actively involved in making sure that their staff members learn. This means that managers continually encourage staff to share information within their departments and also within the entire organization.
Learning corresponds to a commitment to professional development from all aspects in the organization. So from our focus countries and from the financial service providers that we've worked with, we carried out a analysis whereby we compared the bank sizes of the different institutions in comparison with their learning sophistication. And generally, we were able to see that institutions that were bigger in size in terms of portfolio tended to have better learning sophistication. But this was not always the case because we had smaller institutions like, for instance, FSPD on our, on our graph as shown that had also in, uh, invested on their on the learning sophistication systems in the organization. The next point that you need to consider when an, an institution wants to implement an e-learning program is widespread organizational involvement. And what this means is that there is commitment and support throughout the organization, right from the CEO to the middle-level managers and to the junior managers. We have seen from our work with the institutions that we've worked with that success has been seen when the CEO and the HR directors are actively involved in the e-learning program. As we've heard from Kweku, this means that institutions have to invest in strategies that encourage learning and encourage e-learning and develop an e-learning culture that is beneficial to the organization to be able to meet the needs of their clientele. We also noted that those, of those managers that were involved in the e-learning programs that their staff took on these phases of, of, of the study, those, manage, those staff members tended to finish the programs on time tended to be more involved in the activities, in the teamwork activities that were required for some of the courses that they took. External course facilitators were able to do this, but not as well as managers and supervisors of the staff members who took our courses. The last point that we look at that you have to consider when you want to implement an e-learning program is access to e-learning. And access to e-learning in this point means that three things have to be in place. One, there has to be time allocated for learning. The staff members have to have a device, and this could be a laptop, could be a desktop, could be an iPhone, could be a phone, or earphones and other devices that make e-learning possible. And there has to be also an internet connection, just as Kwaku has said that internet connection tended to be an issue and they are looking into ways in which they can make that easier for the staff members. And it has been our experience that not one institution had all of them at the same time. So from this slide, you can see that the main factors that came ac across in terms of difficulties in taking our courses was the internet connection was not adequate. Some staff members said that they had to uh, share computers and therefore they did not have consistent access to proper equipment and also they found it uh, they didn't have uh, sufficient time at work dedicated to the learning So I'm going to hand it over to Christy now, and we will be able to answer your questions in a later, in a later time. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Josephine, and thank you, Kweku and Tausi. Um, so yeah, there were already some really great questions. Um, you know, just a few things that um, we did also want to point out. Um, it was really interesting the, what we learned about access to different devices. Um, you know, you could see from this chart up here that while 73% of our participants 
had access to laptops at home, only 50% of them had access to internet at home. So Gateway Academy is um, addressing this by, we created a, a mobile app um, to help people learn regardless of their device. As you can see, 87% of people had smartphones. Um, but people can also complete the learning offline and then once they're back with a Wi-Fi connection, they can upload their responses and it can track their progress. Um, so one of the things in regards to having, having um, that place for learning, um, we heard from Tausi that AB Zambia created their own their own lab. Um, and really by dedicating that space for learning, they're showing their staff the high value that they place on it. One of the other things to consider that we were surprised to find was that it's important to make sure that the staff has the requisite skills for e-learning, right? Do they, is, is it going to be an easy transition for them? Uh, one organization estimated that about half of their staff did not have the requisite skills for that. Another issue that we found was that internet connectivity, you know, this came up in the earlier presentations, that it's a significant issue. It's also a multi-dimensional issue, right? So many financial institutions will block access to external websites. And so Gateway Academy needed to be cleared, and, and any e-learning platform, um, if it's externally hosted, needs to be cleared for viewing behind the corporate firewall. And we all know how busy IT staff are at, at financial institutions. They wear many, many hats. Um, so getting access to them and ensuring that the site was cleared was often a challenge. It's terrible if a learner's first experience is being blocked. So that's where that earlier point about senior leadership buy-in is so important. Um, internet connectivity within the office can also be a significant problem. Um, so you could see in this chart that the most common response when we asked users about the regularity of internet access, um, and that was specifically asking about within the office, um, nearly half of them said that it's sometimes difficult. So another way that we are exploring solutions to this is creating low bandwidth versions or audio only versions of videos, so they're not so heavy. These uh, Large SCORM packages, e-learning packages can sometimes be very heavy, so we're, we're finding ways around that. Oops, excuse me. So we wanted to thank you very much for, for taking the time to, to listen to this. And there were some great questions coming in through the chat. Um, I don't need to remind you how to add questions, but just in case I do, there's that right-hand box, chat box on the right side of your screen and you can send in your questions. And just please do select all participants to make sure that the moderator can see it. Um, I am going to address a few questions. There were some general questions for Gateway Academy. Um, our colleagues were joining from the Paris office and there was um, just a, small issue there. So I'm going to address the questions uh, that were more general to Gateway Academy. And then as soon as Tausi and Kweku and Josephine are back on, I'll let them take the rest of them. Um, one of the questions that we got was from somebody who wanted to ask about the range of e-learning that was offered on Gateway Academy and what we're talking about. That's a great question. So some of the courses that are offered through Gateway Academy are um, you know, text, images, sort of self-paced, autonomous online courses that people can go through. We also have some courses that are highly facilitated collaborative workshops where participants work together in small teams to 
complete different tasks. Um, so they're learning from the facilitator. The facilitator gives them some framing information, but then they're also learning from each other. And we found that people were really interested in connecting to learners from other financial institutions and also across the region. Somebody else had asked a question, you know, right now, Gateway Academy is, uh, this question was from Rachel. Um, I'm sorry, no, this, sorry about that. Um, right now, uh, Gateway Academy um, is able to, is, is working very closely with different financial service providers. The vision for, and we are also working very closely with specific training service providers to build their capacity to offer e-learning. However, as this market grows, you know, Josephine spoke about how we are facilitating a marketplace here. Um, as that grows, the idea is that FSPs, financial service providers, can come on, can select different courses, training providers can make their courses available for a fee, um, but that, that takes time. So right now that's a very highly facilitated, um, a very highly facilitated process. So uh, Kweku and Tausi, can, are you able to unmute yourselves and speak now? Hello? Christy, I believe we have lost them. They're not on the participant list. Could you maybe address the questions on your end? I will do my very best. Um, so uh, um, apologies. And another thing that I will do is, is um, get back to people who had, who had questions. Um, so sorry about this. So one of our other questions was, um, Nathan asked some questions about making sure, you know, how do we ensure compliance and making sure that learners actually sign up and take this, take these courses? Um, and compliance can be a big problem. That is part of why that manager buy-in is so important. One of the things um, that Gateway Academy is doing while early on, we really focused on that learner experience. In our next round, you know, we're about to release a whole new batch of courses for beta. We have more facilitator tools so that those people who are involved get involved and encourage their learners. That's why we feel like this needs to be, it's an organizational effort and not just an individual learner effort. And there were some other questions about that. It looks like the Paris office is back on. Um, would you guys, can you unmute yourselves? I see that you're back on. Can you hear us? Yes, yes. we can. Yay. <laughs> um, great. great. Thank you. Hooray. We're so happy you're back. Um, <laughs> So here is a question. Um, this is a question for both Tausi and Kweku. Um, can you each speak about benefits that you are seeing at the institution level from e-learning? Um, and you know, how, are you, how are you starting to measure that and think about that? I'll meet myself. Thank you. OK. Um, from from this is quite cool, by the way. Um, from our end, um, the, one of the benefits that we see is that there is obviously that acceptance of an, uh, a continuous learning culture, um, where you don't need to uh, travel from the north or travel from our other provinces or regions to attend a training locally. You can pick 
content on a learning platform and then study on your own at your own pace so um, that's one benefit that we have that there is a um, vast array of learning content on different topics and different subjects available to um, staff to access um, the other thing is that it cost wise is being useful and it's been beneficial there's been some huge reduction in our in our in our, in, in, in our costs uh, but that amount of reduction is then diverted into other means of uh, developing our employees by um, talent management and other aspects of it um, so the opportunity to have that choice to make um, to choose what to learn at what time and the freedom is, is one useful uh, benefit that we, we have seen within our organization so Tausi Okay, Paul, for us, uh, the major benefit that we see, seeing that we are a growing bank, uh, we, we already have about 400 staff, and very soon we'll have more than that, even 1,000. So we're trying to look at the best strategies of having large masses uh, trained, easily trained. So e-learning is one of the strategies, one of the most uh, cost-effective uh, time effective uh, ways that we can reach out to the masses and ensure that um, while there's business continuity, uh, our staff can still uh, build capacity. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Um, I wish that we had more time for questions, um, but I'm afraid afraid we're going to have to wrap up. I wanted to tell you I will share a contact email um, and I'm happy to correspond and make sure that you get your questions answered. Um, we will also email you when the, so I'll, I'll put my email in the chat box for everybody um, at the conclusion. We will also email you when the webinar, webinar recording and all of the materials, all of the slides that you saw will be will be part of that um, and we'll let you know when they're up. I wanted to encourage you all to visit Gateway Academy online. You can sign up for our newsletter, you can take a demo course. Um, the demo course is just a, gives you a small taste. It's a CGAP offered course that's self-paced but there's there's some discussion there. Um, also, on the Gateway Academy website, and that's gateway.academy, you can also download our brochure, see what courses are being offered in beta, and you can sign up to try to take a course and learn more. I also wanted to encourage you, if you found this interesting, our next webinar will be on March 1st. We're going to be talking about how financial institutions are using e-learning to address issues of retention. So thank you very, very much for joining us. Again, our website is www.gateway.academy. And thanks again to the Microfinance Gateway team for hosting us.